Another thing I'm really interested in that, that you talk a lot about in the book is the concept of the golden years. Um, you know, particularly for, for you, and you, you came up not necessarily from a musical background, but from law, um, you know, to, to develop an ear for, for artists. And, um, you know, I guess I'd be curious to hear, you know, how you noticed your transition from, you know, being a legal guy to being a music guy, um, and also kind of the future of the notion of, of golden ears when we have you know, so many more ears tuning in and so many more ways of well, let me hearing. Make, well, I didn't say that. If people are saying I have golden ears, it's certainly something I, I don't say about myself, but I do talk about ears in general. And what I mean by that is I never knew that I don't read music. I didn't have a musical training before I got the gig to head Columbia Records. So... Um, not quite sure the phraseology about mother is the to necessity, but it was necessity for me, and I uh, found myself at the Monterey Pop Festival. I was overwhelmed in seeing the musical revolution, uh, social, cultural revolution there, and I knew in seeing Big Brother and the Holding Company, a group, separate group called the Electric Flag with Buddy Miles on drums and Mike Bloomfield on guitar, that I, even without any training, through the seat of the pants, through instinct, I would have to trust that this was an unusual moment. So I was determined, and I did, uh, ultimately sign Big Brother and the holding company, which meant, of course, Janis Joplin. And then, having been exposed to this revolution, when I got back to New York, by happenstance, I was asked to see this new group called Blood, Sweat, and Tears that was an outgrowth of the Blues Project with Al Cooper and Steve Katz and what Blood, Sweat, and Tears was doing with horns and with jazz and with rock and with blues. You know, again, I was just trusting my instinct. And I would say over the, that ensuing year or so, uh, I was using my instinct and beginning to try to look for the hiring of A&R people to recognize this contemporary music, what I thought and what I think turned out to be a revolution. Um, and so Bill Graham called me and asked me to fly to San Francisco to the Fillmore West and it turned out to be the Santana Group. And that was eye-opening. It was a succession of these cutting-edge rock self-contained groups that I started trusting when they started breaking. And whatever the process was, um, looking for the best, looking for someone cutting edge, not being necessarily sure, but virtuosity was very important to me. So I signed Johnny Winter, a virtuoso of the guitar, and brother Edgar uh, Winter, and ultimate Bob Skaggs, and started putting Lungens and Messina together, and Earth, Wind, and Fire, so that the track record in rock started becoming... Um, sort of feeling good, okay? And I was saying to myself, through a succession of those experiences, my God, maybe I have a natural gift that I never, ever would have known that I had. But do you think it takes a golden ear to recognize a Janis Joplin or a Whitney Houston? Or, you know, where does, where does that kind of gift manifest itself? You mean the man on the street could do it, so... For, I'm not saying you keep using that phrase. The phrase is only <laughs> accurate, I guess, if it's unique to a person or persons. Um, look, you appraise, one appraises, hundreds of artists until you say that one. Then you see many more. You get tapes and you get video. Well, today you get videos and you so that it's a track record. No one's a thousand percent, no batter in baseball, you know, is such. But um, if you're asking what is the criterion for that, the criterion is 
that you have a damn good batting average. Probably, I wish if I have ever done this before, but probably maybe two-thirds of what you sign make it or more. 